Hello, it's what the heck? Togon. And it's time for a new video. So in the last video, I provided three pretty neat little proofs that the harmonic series does diverge. It does not sum to a finite real number. And at the end of the video, I showed that you could break up the series into three categories. Just the first term, which is one, and then a sum over the reciprocal composite numbers and a sum over the reciprocal prime numbers. Very, very easily you can show that the sum over the reciprocal composites diverges by simply realizing that the sum has all of the multiples of one-fourth, which add to one-fourth of the harmonic series, and one-fourth of something that is infinitely large is also infinitely large. So if the composite series contains that subseries, it itself must diverge. Now because at least one subseries of the harmonic series diverges, that shows that the harmonic series diverges. That means that the prime reciprocals do not necessarily diverge. As it turns out, they do, and I'm going to prove that in this video. That and a little bonus thing I'm going to put at the beginning, which will also involve the Riemann zeta function, are both going to serve as two proofs that there are infinitely many prime numbers. So now we're going to use the fact that the harmonic series diverges to provide two proofs that there are infinitely many primes, which is very, very nice. The first one is going to be quite easy. We're going to use the Euler product. Many of you will have seen this before. If you've seen anything involving the harmonic series and the Riemann zeta function as it gets closer to one as an input. And then we're going to prove that the sum of reciprocals of prime numbers diverges and because it diverges, it must have infinitely many terms, which will prove that there are infinitely many prime numbers. So let's do that. Okay, so this is the classical definition of the Riemann zeta function that I'm sure most of you have seen before. So we have capital zeta of a complex argument z is equal to the sum from k equals 1 to infinity of 1 over k to the z power. So this is adding reciprocal powers of integers. That's the original definition of this function, and it only converges for complex numbers z that have a real part that is greater than 1. We can see in particular, if we're talking about real inputs, if we let z go to 1, then this z in the power will become 1, and we will have our harmonic series, which we know diverges. So in particular, zeta of 1 is equal to the sum from k equals 1 to infinity of 1 over k, which we know is the harmonic series. I know this is uncouth, but we'll just say it equals infinity for the sake of brevity. So this is an infinitely large quantity. We know that it diverges. And because of those three proofs from the previous video, we're surely very, very confident in that. Um, and what we're going to do now is establish our first proof that there are, in fact, infinitely many prime numbers. That's because Euler was able to prove that the Riemann zeta function, again, for real part greater than 1, is equal to this fantastic product over the prime numbers. So it's equal to, for p contained, I'm just going to do the fancy p for prime, so p in the fancy p, which stands for prime, so little p in the prime set of prime numbers, and it's the product over 1 minus p to the negative z, all to the negative 1. Right, so Euler was able to prove this. I'm not going to go through this proof. It's very easy to find. I'm sure Papa Flammy has done something on this before. But what we know is that zeta of 1 diverges, right? Zeta of 1 is an infinite quantity. And so if we plug in 1 here, we know that this will also have to diverge. So let's see what happens when we do that. So we're going to plug in zeta of 1, and we get that this is equal to the product over primes p of 1 minus p to the negative 1 all to the negative 1. Well, let's simplify this a bit p to the negative 1 is 1 over p, so we can write this as, but 1 minus 1 over p is equal to, if you simply multiply through in the denominator, it's equal to p minus 1 over p, all to the negative 1 power, and because the negative 1 is there, that means we can just reciprocate all of the terms and we get the product over the primes of p divided by p minus 1, right? So this is every prime number divided by the integer below it, multiplied through all of them, which if you write it out is equal to 2 divided by 1 times 3 divided by 2 times 5 divided by 4 times 7 divided by 6 times etc etc. So this is the numerator is the product of all the prime numbers and the denominator is the product of all the numbers that are one less than those prime numbers. Which means that each fraction is more than one but in every case each fraction the limit of each of the terms is going to one. Really the only way to define an infinite product in the same way that an infinite sum its terms have to go to zero for it to converge an infinite products terms have to go to one for that infinite product to converge. This is not necessarily an infinite product but what I'm about to tell you will show that it is because we know that 
that this is equal to zeta of 1, which is the harmonic series, which is infinite. A, a finite product could never, could, could never go to an infinite uh, value, could never diverge, which means that there must be infinitely many terms. And since the numerator of every single one of these fractions is a prime number, that must mean, QED, that there are infinitely many primes. So this is proof number one that there have to be infinitely many primes. And just like in the last video when I showed three proofs that the harmonic series diverges, I avoided the one that we've all seen before, I'm going to avoid Euclid's proof, that, that very famous proof of infinitely many primes, because I think this is more interesting. So I'm going to have two proofs today. This is the first one, right? We know that the harmonic series diverges from the last video. We know from ver seeing it many times that the Riemann zeta function is equal to this product over the primes for z with real part greater than 1. And we know that if we plug in 1, we end up with this product of prime numbers divided by the prime numbers minus 1, all multiplied together. Since this does diverge, there must be infinitely many terms. And since every numerator is a prime number, that must mean that there are infinitely many prime numbers. Done. Proof number one complete. So before we start the second proof that there are infinitely many primes, I need to establish two results that I'm going to need at the end that I would rather prove now than have to do with a cluttered board. So we're going to consider the function f of x equals 1 over x to the k. And so we're going to do this in the xy plane, of course. And it comes down from its vertical asymptote, approaches its horizontal asymptote. And now we want to consider the function at different integer values. So we're going to look at, oops, sorry about that. We're going to look at 1, 2, 3, 4, and that just goes forever. So every integer value. And what we're going to do is we're just going to raise a rectangle at each inter integer value taking the uh, justification, right? So the intersection of the curve and the rectangles is on the rightmost corner. So k is some positive integer, right? So it's, so it's, a, it's a reciprocal power function. And you'll notice that <coughs> each of these is, is the, the area of each of these rectangles is 1 over every integer to the kth power. Because look, at 2, this function gives 1 over 2 to the k. So whatever k is, that's this height right here, 1 over 2 to the k, and the width is 1. So the area of this rectangle is 1 over 2 to the k. Likewise, the area of this rectangle is 1 over 3 to the k, 1 over 4 to the k, etc., etc., forever and ever. If we take a look at the area under the curve over the same interval of the function, you'll notice that each of the rectangles, which is 1 over n to the k for all the various integers, right? n is just these integers here, always less than the integral from n minus 1 to n of this function. So it's less than the integral from n minus 1 to n of this function 1 over t to the k dt. Each rectangle, which has area 1 over n to the k at the, at the right edge of the rectangle is less than the integral from n minus 1 to n under the same function. So we need that fact. We're going to need that fact later. And another fact that we need is consider summing over all the reciprocal powers of the positive integers except the first power. So first we're going to think of, say, summing over all of the powers of the integers n, but then also summing over all of those integers from n equals 2 to infinity. Quick explanation here, and sorry for the bad audio, I can't find my microphone. The reason n starts from 2 is because if we let it start from 1, we'd end up summing also over all the powers of 1 over 1, and an infinite sum of 1s is of course infinite, so we have to exclude that case because it would make the sum infinitely large. We also have to exclude the case where k is equal to 1, because even without the case where n equals 1, we would just have a sum over the harmonic series minus the first term 1. So since the harmonic series diverges, taking away just the first term 1 doesn't make that value any smaller. Both the cases where n equals 1 and where k equals 1 would add an infinite quantity to our sum, whereas the rest of it is finite, as you will see in a few minutes. Because n is always bigger than or equal to 2, 1 over n is always going to be less than 1. Since we're summing over powers, we can just use the geometric series. right? So this is going to be, since we're not starting at 0, we're starting at k equals 2, we have to multiply by 1 over n twice to account for the fact that we aren't starting at the 0th power of 1 over n. And so what we end up with is the sum from n equals 2 to infinity of 1 over n squared divided by 1 minus 1 over n. That's just the geometric series. If we sum from k equals 0 to infinity, we would just get 1 over 1 minus 1 over n. But because we're starting two powers up, we have to multiply by two more powers of that to account for that. We can sort of distribute the n squared into the denominator, and we end up with the sum from n equals 2 to infinity of 1 over n squared times 1 is n squared 
minus 1 over n times n squared is minus n. And we can factor these out as sum from n equals 2 to infinity of 1 over n times n minus 1. Now, numbers that are the product of consecutive integers like that are called pronic numbers. They are like 1 over 2 times 1, 1 over 3 times 2, 1 over 4 times 3, etc., etc. And because this, is, uh, this grows like 1 over n squared, by p-series, this is going to converge. So we know it's going to converge by summing from 2 to infinity. So it's fine. We're not dividing by 0, and it's like 1 over n squared. So we can assume that it will converge because it will converge. And what we're going to have to do is prove what this is equal to. So because it's going from n equals 2 to infinity, it's going to look like 1 over 2 times 1 plus 1 over 3 times 2 plus 1 over 4 times 3 plus dot dot dot. And what you can do is a little bit of arithmetic to see that this fraction can be written like so. So we have the sum from n equals 2 to infinity of 1 over n minus 1 minus 1 over n, which means that this sum, if you, if you find the common denominator and add the numerators, you will get back to that fraction there. And you'll find that this sum looks like 1 over 1 minus 1 half plus 1 half minus 1 third plus 1 third minus dot dot dot. And you'll find that every term after the 1 cancels with the term after it. So negative one half plus one half is zero, negative one third plus one third is zero. And instead of starting at infinity, we could start with m and then see that we end up with minus one over m at the end and then take the limit as m goes to infinity and that fraction goes to zero. And so we just end up with one. The sum of all of the so-called pronic numbers, which are products of consecutive integers, is one. And so we're going to need that later on at the end of the proof. Isn't it kind of interesting, though, that summing over every single integer from 2 on up and every power of all of those integers from 2 on up comes out to something as small as 1? Isn't that interesting? Um, another way to actually consider this, because everything here is absolutely convergent, we can just flip the sums. And you'll notice that that means that this is also equal to the sum from k equals 2 to infinity, so putting that one on the outside, of the sum from n equals 2 to infinity of 1 over n to the k. But now look what we've done. We've, we've considered now n to be our running index. But what does this look like? If we're keeping k fixed and running over the integers as the basis, this is just the Riemann zeta function. But it's the Riemann zeta function without the first term, right? We're starting at n equals 2. And the first term of the Riemann zeta function in the original definition is always 1. So this sum here is just zeta of k minus 1, which means that 1 here is equal to the sum from k equals 2 to infinity over the Riemann zeta function of k minus 1, which means all of those values of zeta, like pi squared over 6, pi to the fourth over 90, and all the odd ones that we don't have a closed form for yet, if you take 1 away from all of them and add them all together, you end up with 1. So this is actually the same thing as saying that the sum from k equals 2 to infinity of the fractional part of the Riemann zeta function of k is equal to 1, right? Because all of the values of zeta from 2 to infinity as the inputs always are between 1 and 2. And they get closer and closer to 1 as k gets bigger and bigger. So taking away 1 from any of them leaves you just with the fractional part. So the, fraction, the sum of the fractional parts of all the zeta values at integers greater than 1 is 1. Isn't that wacky? This was just a fun fact. The thing that we needed for this proof was the reverse of this. So back to the original where we say that the sum over all the pronic numbers is 1 because we're going to need that as an upper bound later. Things like this will come up later when we talk more about the euler mascheroni constant. So on to the proof. I have an Instagram page for the channel. It is at what the hectagon, of course, spelled correctly, unlike my email, right? Hectagon, I spelled in the email with an A here when in fact it's an O. What the hectagon on Instagram. So this is Instagram. I post channel updates there. I also am doing a lot more reading than I used to now, so I'm posting books that I'm reading that I recommend to people. I have a collection of vinyl records that I like to share. Follow me at what the hectagon on Instagram. I'd like to point out that uh, one of my best friends, who is very much into Dungeons and Dragons, has a YouTube channel called Marching West. He does like a little podcast about Dungeons and Dragons. He does Dungeons and Dragons all the time through his Discord server. He's very, very into it, and I'm sure he would appreciate a bit of a mention. So if you're into Dungeons and Dragons, visit his YouTube channel, Marching West. He also has an Instagram account, again, at Marching West. Also, this fellow, Bill and I, are starting a, another YouTube channel. I guess you could call it personal reasons, even though it's just kind of funny. Is called Fredwood Live. 
on YouTube were just called Fredwood. Uh, it's an amalgamation of two different things that uh, were sort of important to us in our college days, um, which are <laughs> getting farther and farther behind us. So this is again YouTube. We have a channel called Fredwood. We're going to do kind of silly, just us riffing off of each other vlogs that we edit together in humorous ways. But we're also going to start doing weekly video game streams on Mixer. And on Mixer, our name is Fred Wood Live. So if you want to see two kind of dopey former college students do kind of ridiculous video game streams and also other things that we're going to do on top of that on Mixer, our username is Fred Wood Live, so check us out. Likewise, we have a Twitter account to promote it, also at Fred Wood Live. So I apologize for all of these different promotions. I figured I'd just start putting these out there. So there's a few that I'd like you to check out if you're interested. Is my Instagram account, What the Hectagon. Uh, on YouTube, my buddy Bill's channel, Marching West, it has to do with podcasts and the like relating to Dungeons & Dragons. The Instagram account for channel updates for that channel. Our joint channel, Fredwood, where we're going to be posting stream clips and vlogs that we make, which are not in any way intended to be serious. It's all supposed to be just kind of humorous. We are going to stream on Mixer, because that's the only way that we can use the camera that we have on my Xbox One, and we're not about to buy a Kinect to do on Twitch. So Mixer, Fredwood Live, and the Twitter account for that is at Fredwood Live. So if you're interested in any of these things, please give us a follow. I really appreciate it.